I need some background music. We do. We could use a little background music. <laughs> some elevator music while people are waiting. <laughs> or foresty music. What would that be? <laughs> Birds chirping. Yeah. <laughs> Katie did's doing their thing. <laughs> We've got folks still trickling in, um, so we'll give it another minute maybe before we get started. That's right. When we say four o'clock, we mean four o'clock, people. <laughs> so, good job if you're here. Well, that attendee number was climbing there for a bit, but now it's, <laughs> I might just go ahead and get started if you guys are, are ready. Um, we know that more people will continue to join, um, but yeah, thanks again to those of you who are here on time. We appreciate it. Um, we are, uh, well, so I'm Susan Bean. I'm the Community Engagement Manager for Mountain True, uh, hosting this webinar here. You are all uh, attending the webinar um, as attendees rather than panelists, so you are muted and we don't see your video. You should just see the four of us um, panelist speakers. Uh, our plan is to have 45 minutes to an hour of presentation from Josh Kelly, uh, and then we will turn it over to Q&A. Um, you can use the Q&A feature at the bottom of your screen. If you scroll your mouse down to the bottom of the screen, there should be an icon for Q&A, and you can open that up and type in questions. Uh, during the presentation. We have Callie Moore, our Western Regional Director, um, also on, uh, on the call, and she will be managing that Q&A panel. Uh, answer, some questions she'll type answers to um, during the presentation, others she will hold and, and pitch to either Josh Kelly or Mary Leitner at the end. Um, so feel free to type your questions in throughout. Uh, at the end of the presentation, there will be a browser window open on your screen that is Mountain True's uh, full summary analysis of the forest, the draft forest management plan, um, and the links with options to um, submit your public comments to the Forest Service. So we encourage you to take a look at that after the presentation is over. Um, I believe that is it for the housekeeping. So I will now turn it over to Mary Leitner, who has an extensive background in public policy and serves as the president of the Public Policy Network. So she will get us started. Uh, welcome, everybody. For those of you who don't know, uh, the Public Policy Network is a civic organization that monitors state and national policy proposals that affect individuals and our communities. We're an all-volunteer group that provides data, information, and resources to enable the citizens of Western North Carolina and North Georgia to make informed decisions about policies that affect them. We have three main focus areas, healthcare, financial security, and the environment. And we have uh, three Facebook groups on those topics. And we invite you to join those. Um, today, we're really uh, delighted to be partnering with Mountain True. And I'd like to introduce our presenter, Josh Kelly, who's the public lands field biologist uh, for Mountain True. He is a native North Carolinian. He went to school at UNC Asheville uh, and earned a degree in biology. He's worked for the Southern Appalachian Forest Coalition, where he focused on identifying remnant old growth forests and public land. He also worked at Wild Law, where he worked to promote ecological restoration as the new paradigm for the national forest management. Josh also helped the Forest Service conduct rare plant surveys and save hemlocks from the hemlock woolly adult gig. 
at Mountain True, Josh monitors logging and development issues on public land and provides site-specific information to promote ecological restoration and oppose ecologically damaging management. So he's very well qualified to talk with us today about the impact of this plan, which will affect our environment for the next 15 or 20 years to come. So it's really important and um, he's gonna provide uh, some ways that we can influence that plan. Um, I believe the deadline for commenting is May 14th. And um, so he'll give us some tips on how we can influence um, important policy decisions about um, what's gonna happen to our force uh, uh, for the foreseeable future. Josh? Thanks for that great introduction, Mary, and thanks for everyone uh, for being here on your computer on such a nice uh, Sunday. Um, yeah, COVID-19 has interrupted our lives a lot, and originally I had planned to be down there in Clay County talking with everybody in person, and I'm um, disappointed I can't be there, but I'm glad that we can make this work anyway. Um, Mary mentioned that the comment period for the draft forest plan was scheduled to end on May 14th. Uh, due to COVID-19, the Forest Service has delayed that deadline and the final deadline has not been set yet. Uh, so I would encourage folks whenever you're ready to go ahead and comment just to make sure that that deadline doesn't sneak by. Most likely the deadline will end sometime in June, I would, I would predict, or possibly July. Um, so I've got a, a lot of information to share with you all today. Uh, so I'll go ahead and uh, get my presentation opened up. Uh, I've got about um, 80 slides to get through in under an hour. Uh, hopefully it won't be too dry. This is a very dense and complicated subject and I'll, I'll try to uh, give you a full overview uh, without uh, getting too bogged down in the details. So Mountain True, if you're not familiar with us, you probably are being folks who are um, really interested in public policy as an organization that champions resilient forests, clean water, and healthy communities uh, throughout Western North Carolina. We have been around under different names since 1982. And one of the things we've worked on since the beginning is public land management and particularly uh, national forest management. I'm a biologist, so when I talk to folks about this landscape we live in, I always like to talk about the biological diversity we have and what a rich area this is for biodiversity. Our uh, region here, the Southern Blue Ridge Mountains that stretches from Southwest Virginia to North Georgia, is home to over a thousand restricted endemic species that occur nowhere else on Earth and is particularly diverse in species like salamanders, crayfish, and freshwater mussels that thrive in our high rainfall uh, environment and the many streams that come out of the mountains. Uh, we have generally really high aquatic diversity because of all those uh, streams and all the rainfall. And our ecosystem diversity is equal to that of basically taking a drive from Georgia to Maine. We have all of the basic ecosystems you have over a 700 mile drive just from hiking from the bottom of the Smoky Mountains to the top of the Smoky Mountains. The Nantahala Pisgah is really exceptional because it's the largest piece of public land in this exceptional bioregion of the Southern Blue Ridge. There's over a million acres of land that are owned in common by the American people on the Nantahala Pisgah. Um, despite being such a big chunk of land, it's only 22% of the forest in the 18 county uh, planning area. And uh, just for a, a, a check on that, you know, something like 68% uh, of forests in Western North Carolina are privately owned. So we do have a lot of public land. We're very fortunate for that, but uh, the majority of forest is private land. So the public land is important because it can uh, provide some opportunities that the private land does not provide. Uh, Nantahala Pisgah National Forest can, uh, creates a lot of drinking water, protects a lot of drinking water. Um, it receives over 7 million visitors annually and uh, always amongst the uh, top two or three uh, most visited national forests in the nation. Has the highest mountains in the eastern United States and is, like I said, probably the most biodiverse national forest because it's in one of the most biodiverse regions of the United States. So since we're talking about Forest Service land, I always like to clarify for folks how the Forest Service fits in to the portfolio of public lands that we have here in the U.S. Um, the, the Forest Service is pretty unique in that it is uh, in the Department of Agriculture, and most of our public land is in the Department of the Interior. So the National Park Service, the Bureau of Land Management, and the uh, National Wildlife Refuge System are all under the Department of the Interior, whereas the Forest Service was placed under the Department of Agriculture. Um, 
when you look at the distribution of public land in the United States, there's a, a huge majority of it is in the Western US. Um, the historical reasons for that are that um, lands in the East had already been basically doled out to private landowners, uh, many of them Revolutionary War soldiers or other folks who had uh, land claims uh, prior to the idea of public land being important. By the time we started colonizing as a, as a nation, the Western part of the continent, um, we, the federal government saw fit to keep most of those lands in federal, or a lot of those lands in federal ownership. In the East, most of our lands actually had to be repurchased from private owners uh, prior to being federal lands, and that's the case in North Carolina. When you look at this map, North Carolina stands out as having uh, a large amount of public land relative to other Eastern states. Uh, uh, purportedly almost 12% of the state, but I think that does include military bases. The US Forest Service nationwide has about 193 million acres and uh, only 13 million of those are in the Southeast uh, with about four and a half million acres in the Southern Appalachians. And again, the Nantahala Pisgah National Forest with a million acres is, is a big chunk of that Southern Appalachian land. Gifford Pinchot is the person most often credited for the founding of the Forest Service. He was one of the first uh, foresters in the United States and a friend of Teddy Roosevelt. And he had a couple of ideas that are still with us today. One is this idea of multiple use and sustained yield. So Forest Service lands are different than national park lands in that they provide uh, multiple uses and also uh, resources and economic activity that uh, Park Service lands don't provide like minerals and wood and grazing rights and things like that. Uh, also, this idea that uh, the guiding light for national forest management should be the greatest good for the greatest number in the long run. And because we live in such a populated part of the country, in a forest that's uh, so important, that question of what is the greatest good for the greatest number in the long run is always really an active conversation in our region. Forest service uh, lands are often called lands of many uses. And uh, you know, here's a slide showing some of those uses. Recreation is probably the way that most people uh, use the forest. Uh, and that can vary from angling, rock climbing, scenic viewing, hiking, bicycling, uh, hunting, fishing, uh, wild, you know, wildlife viewing, all sorts of things. Um, you know, but in addition to all those recreational uses, as I mentioned, there's also uh, built into forest service management uh, fiber in the form of wood, grazing, which is not such a big thing in the east, it's a very big thing in the west, and minerals. Um, so some, some of these uh, goals and multiple uses can be in tension, and it's the Forest Service job to make them fit together in a way that works for the American people and for the health of the land. The National Forest Management Act is the initial piece of legislation passed in 1976 that is the reason that we have forest plans. Prior to that, national forests were managed at the discretion basically of district rangers and forest supervisors. And so each district could be managed in very different ways. Um, after 1976, all national forest and grasslands were required to have a management plan. It took 11 years after the passage of the act for uh, Western North Carolina to have its for first forest plan in 1987. Um, Plans are required to be revised every 10 to 15 years, but in fact, that actually happens much slower. Uh, our plan, as you know, is now over 30 years old with one major amendment in 1994. So while the goal is for 10 to 15 years, who knows how long our next forest plan will last. It will last, I would say, a minimum of 10 to 15 years. Uh, plans are created to coordinate the multiple uses while plans are in implemented with projects. Plans do not set these uh, site-specific actions that will lead to the goals of the plan. Those are actually implemented by projects and plans are basically a set of instructions under which the Forest Service creates projects. Our current plan is basically the 1994 amendment to the 1987 forest plan. The 1987 forest plan was unfortunately a very unsustainable forest plan that harvested timber beyond the sustainable limit of the forest. There's a lot of reasons for that, but the two most important reasons were, number one, Jesse Helms, a uh, senator from North Carolina, put a, uh, a rider on a Senate bill that required the Nantahala Pisgah to double their timber output. And number two, uh, during the planning process, the Forest Service did not account for the many streams and for water quality and how much land area really needed to be de devoted to watershed uh, protection. So the 94 Amendment did a few things that were very innovative at the time. It included protections for streams and wetlands that hadn't been there before, although those, uh, those protections are now fairly out of date, and also included minimum quantities of old, older forests. 
Uh, in general, the 1994 forest plan, like many plans across the country, has not been fully implemented due to budget cuts and also due to um, social disagreements, I would say, political and social disagreements over the place of national forests and the role of national forests. And probably the most con two most controversial issues in our, in our region are timber harvest on the one hand and wilderness designation on the other. And this is a chart of the arc of timber harvest since 1976, since the uh, National Forest Management Act. The main thing to notice about this arc is that in the 1980s, there was a, almost an exponential growth in timber harvest up until about 1988. And then it dropped back down. And, and through the mid 90s, it was at a fairly reasonable but declining level. And then post 2000, it's been at a very low level. So uh, our, our forest is certainly being managed sustainably in the sense that there's not more timber being cut than the land can sustain at this point. But in the 1980s, those limits were, were not being adhered to. This forest plan is pretty unique and a national leader in that it's being uh, drafted under the 2012 planning rule. And the 2012 planning rule is an effort to um, make plans easier to draft than under the original 1982 planning rule um, that directs the Forest Service and how to create a forest plan. So all plans under this new planning rule must maintain or increase ecological integrity of the land. And what, so what's ecological integrity? The ecological integrity is basically uh, defined as the ecosystems on the national forest being within uh, a historical range of variation. So being within a historically consistent condition, uh, not degraded from a historically consistent condition. Generally, uh, the industrial period is excluded from that notion of historical range of variation or natural range of variation. Um, the 2012 rule relaxed the standard from the 1982 rule to, to make the plans easier to, to draft. It requires an all lands approach where the Forest Service is required to look at trends across other lands bordering the Forest Service, whether they be private lands, state lands, other federal lands. Uh, the 2012 rule also requires that climate change be considered, uh, includes a lot of direction on ecological restoration, and includes an emphasis on public participation and collaboration. So you might say, well, what is, what is collaboration in the sense of, of forest planning? Um, collaboration, in my opinion, is this notion of how we can achieve the greatest benefit for a variety of interests with the least conflict. Um, it's a move away from the, you know, this tension over uh, fighting over resources to uh, helping each other achieve our needs. Uh, from a zero sum to a win-win. So, you know, in a zero sum uh, game in the past, I think timber interests were also interested in, uh, in preventing protections, while folks who are more interested in say, ecological management of the forest or natural area management of the forest might, might've been interested in stopping timber harvest. What we're really trying to do with this plan is trying to make these sometimes competing interests fit together in a way where there isn't goal interference and isn't competition. Uh, and I would just tell folks, whatever your interests are in the forest, uh, I think it's important to remember that there are many other people in the region and in the country that have different interests and that for national forests to remain strong and to have a broad base of public uh, support that I think uh, it's best for the most people to have their interests represented. So again, forest plans are basically instructions to the Forest Service for how they should manage the land under projects that they create. So the forest plan answers the question, what value should we promote or protect in each general area of the forest? So inside the forest plan, if you actually take the time to read this, there are plan components that get at uh, different scales of, uh, uh, of that question of how the, the good of the forest should be pr protected and promoted. So there are goals and desired conditions that are basically aspirational and look at long-term direction of the forest and how it should look in the long term. Objection, objectives are uh, generally numbers placed on the amount of work that will occur per decade or per year uh, under Forest Service management. Um, and this plan is pretty innovative in the, in the sense that every alternative, there are three action alternatives and all of them have the same uh, objectives, basically. And uh, standards and guides are the rules, basically, the, the specific instructions that uh, you know, the Forest Service will follow to say protect rare species or to design trails that are going to be constructed or to do road maintenance or to uh, protect water quality. So you've got a forest plan and under the forest plan projects are created. What do projects do? If you're not familiar with Forest Service management, projects basically um, 
uh, go th throughout regions of the forest, usually watershed by watershed or area by area, and um, and create a set of activities to implement the forest plan. So if it's a, an area that uh, allows timber harvest, the project will decide which trees are going to be cut and how many, and what will be the goals for those, that tree cutting. What ecological goals will there be? What economic goals? What scenic goals? What wildlife goals? All those sorts of things. Um, so, you know, and when it comes to say uh, an objective like road maintenance in a, in a management area that, uh, that has open roads, um, this plan has a goal uh, that was basically created by pressure from local uh, county governments to increase the amount of open roads. So if you're in the matrix and interface management area, which roads will be open and why? That will be one of the questions a project would answer. Um, so and these qu questions can be harder or easier to answer depending on how detailed a forest plan is. So getting to the details of this uh, forest plan, First impressions of the draft plan so far is that the Forest Service has done a really good job of trying to listen to the public. Um, there are some really innovative things about the forest plan, mostly that the alternatives uh, are fairly diverse and they do their best to not pit interest against each other. Um, and one of the ways they do that is by having those consistent objectives that I talked about. Unfortunately, the plan has very weak plan standards, in my opinion, and because of the weak st plan standards, none of the three alternatives offered is sufficient. Uh, and uh, I think the bright side is, though, by, by improving plan standards and tweaking management area boundaries, uh, a great plan is in reach. Um, and, you know, one concept to understand is that the final uh, plan that comes out will probably not look exactly like any of the three alternatives that's out there. So uh, keep that in mind. You don't necessarily have to choose any of the three alternatives. So inside the draft plan, there are these instructions that provide guidance and rules at different scales. There are forest-wide uh, goals, objectives, standards, and guides. There are geographic area descriptions that you can read that will describe the desired conditions and management strategies within each geographic area. There are ecozone desired conditions, and the ecozones are basically the, the large ecosystems, the, the dominant ecosystems throughout the area. Uh, and then there are management areas, and management areas are basically analogous to uh, zoning and private land use, where some areas are going to be zoned for more intensive use and some for lighter use. Uh, some will have maybe an emphasis on, uh, say, the Appalachian Trail, while others might have uh, an emphasis on um, more developed recreation or uh, timber harvest and wildlife management. So there are, I believe, a dozen geographic areas. I won't take the time to list them all, but here they all are on this map. If you are uh, down there in Southwest North Carolina, like I think many of you on this uh, webinar are, uh, some, of the, some of the geographic areas down there are the Nantahala Mountains, the Hiawassee uh, geographic area, the Unicoi Mountains, Fontana Lake, and Nantahala Gorge, uh, for example. And so each of those will have desired conditions in the plan and a description you can read if you want to see what the Forest Service is thinking about there. Um, ecozones are plant communities, basically, and they are reoccurring throughout the landscape. Uh, and this is sort of a diagram on how they, th those might lay on a mountaintop where, you know, at the tops of the mountains, you're going to have spruce fir forest, and coming down the slope, you'll have a variety of oak forest, and down at the bottom of the mountain, you'll have shortleaf pine forest, and in coves and along streams, you'll have either acidic or rich cove forest, and et cetera, et cetera. Uh, the plan has a lot of detailed in, uh, information on these ecozones and uh, what is needed to restore them. So that's a, a very strong part of the plan, I think. So the draft management areas are most easily divided into two categories. Um, suitable management areas have scheduled timber harvest where commercial timber is the primary or secondary reason for that harvest. Um, and those two management areas are matrix and interface. Matrix emphasizes creating a mix of patches of forest of uniform age through commercial timber harvest. Whereas interface is similar to matrix, but has a little bit greater emphasis on recreation access and scenery. Interface often surrounds open roads, paved roads, and sometimes heavily used trails. Uh, backcountry is the third largest management area, and, and some, and some uh, alternatives the second largest. Um, and is managed for non-motorized access. Uh, forest age is influenced primarily through natural processes in the backcountry management area. There are a lot of other management areas to consider. Uh, existing wilderness and recommended wilderness 
uh, will be managed in accordance with the Wilderness Act. Special interest areas are used to manage areas of special biological, geological, and cultural significance. And the Forest Service is uh, proposing about 93,000 acres of special interest areas in the plan. Appalachian Trail Corridor manages scenery within half a mile of the trail. Uh, Roan Mountain Management Area manages the special uh, habitats around Roan Mountain. And ecological interest area uses active management to restore ecosystems in areas of the forest that are known for their diversity, but also have some need for active management. Uh, so this is just a, a slide showing how those various management areas overlay on the Pisgah Ranger District around Brevard, North Carolina. Um, and you can see the dark green there is wilderness, that um, lime green is sort of backcountry and the, the, the lighter uh, green is matrix, um, yellow is interface, et cetera, brown is ecological interest area. So this is how that looks under alternative C in the plan. Um, the idea of having old growth restoration patches got carried forward from the old plan into this plan, and each alternative has different amounts of old growth allocation, allocation and we'll talk more about that later. So basically, the draft alternatives represent the range of options on the table, especially when it comes to the allocation of management areas. So you can you know, look at the maps and, and get a sense for the, the different acreages, and there's also tables within the plan that can show you the acreages of those management, area, uh, management areas by alternative. Some of the issues that are most important to Mountain True and some of the other um, conservation groups involved in the forest plan are recommended wilderness, uh, wilderness inventory areas that were identified as being suitable for wilderness but were not ultimately recommended as such, and then uh, the North Carolina natural heritage natural areas. Um, each alternative uh, handles these differently, uh, and, and alternative A for reference is the current forest plan. So if you look at you know, the acreage of, uh, of suitable management area, um, varies by alternative with uh, alternative A having the least amount of land open to suitable management uh, and uh, alternative B having the most. Um, and then each of these alternatives handles these issues differently. So alternative B has the most land available for suitable management and the most amount of man land available or recommended as wilderness, which is unusual for a Forest Service plan um, and really demonstrates that there isn't uh, any sort of inherent conflict between wilderness recommendation and designation and timber harvest on our national forest. Um, and you know, unsurprisingly, there's there's different levels of areas left unprotected. So alternatives B and D do leave a lot of uh, wilderness inventory areas and natural heritage natural areas in uh, the matrix and interface management areas. Alternative C does fairly well with those, although uh, 34,000 acres of the natural heritage natural areas are still unprotected in alternative C. So you may be wondering which alternative you should vote for. I would say don't vote for any of them. As much as possible, I would talk about uh, specific uh, issues you, you have with the plan, either things that you like a lot about the plan or things that you think the Forest Service should change. Um, you can, uh, if you know places well, I would uh, talk about those places and tell the Forest Service what you'd like to see them do. And in general, we're here to help you understand how the draft will affect all of these different issues and places. So if you have questions, feel free to reach out to me or Callie or any other Mountain Tree staff. So at this point, I'm about halfway through the presentation. And I just want to take a break now and see if there are any uh, questions that have come up um, that I could get to at this point. And, and just to remind folks, you can use the Q&A uh, button down at the bottom of your screen. Um, you can just take your mouse down there and hover over it. If you have a question, type it in there and I can get to it now. If not, uh, I'll also have time at the end of the talk. But uh, I think sometimes it's nice to, to break up these long uh, presentations with a little bit of interaction. We actually do have one question um, so far, and that is uh, a mention, I believe it was the slide that had the timeline um, with the dates and things. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. It said on there, turkey hunters win lawsuit in 1976. Yes. And the question is, were hunters the original drivers of the, basically, the rule that got us management plans? Uh, I would say the answer to that is yes. Um, I got that information from, there's a great book out there if you uh, like history and like nonfiction, it's called Blue Ridge Commons, an environmental history of the Blue Ridge, uh, or of Western North Carolina, pardon me. It's by Catherine Newfont. And in that book, uh, 
Dr. Newfont, uh, looks at the history of Nantahala Pisgah National Forest, actually. And so she has to talk about management plans. And so the origin of, of the National Forest Management Act is, uh, comes from West Virginia, actually, where there was a turkey hunting club that had a piece of private land that backed up to the Forest Service. And in the early 70s, the Forest Service uh, made a 300 acre clear cut right behind their turkey hunting area. And that did not make those hunters very happy. So they talked to their senators, including one of them was Senator Byrd at the time, I believe. And that led to legislation that became the National Forest Management Act. Thank you. Um, we have another one that just popped up. Let me see what it's saying right now. Okay, this, this is what's coming, um, and this is from Alex. She, she asks, will you let us know at some point if there are any aspects of the proposed plan that Mountain True is especially concerned or worried about? I would like to make sure we are speaking with one voice on the most critical issues. So I, I believe that's the second half of the presentation, so that's a perfect lead in. <laughs> yes, absolutely. Um, so yeah, we'll get to the, the key issues uh, at this point in the, in the presentation. Um, and the, again, these are the key issues according to Mountain True. I think many people uh, across the ideological spe spectrum would agree with these key issues, however. Um, so public access and recreation is definitely a key issue on, on these forests. The, the, probably the biggest or one of the biggest public benefits is just the ability to get out in nature and enjoy nature on our national forests um, in whatever way people like to do it. Clean water is one of the reasons which national forests were founded for and because we get so much rain around here and we have the highest elevations in the east, we are the headwaters of, of many drinking supplies that uh, feed drinking supplies for many tens of millions of people in the southeast. So that's a, very much a key issue. Um, wildlife habitat is a key issue. It's, it supports the diversity of species in our region. Um, natural heritage, natural areas are these areas that were identified by the North Carolina Natural Heritage Program. Every state has a natural heritage program. And part of their mission is to identify the key areas for maintaining the natural history and species diversity of each state. And the North Carolina Natural Heritage Program has done inventories of 98 of the 100 counties in Western North Carolina, the only two counties, or in North Carolina as a whole, the only two counties that do not have inventories are Clay and Swain counties. So uh, if you live in Clay or Swain County or thereabouts, you might uh, talk to your lawmakers about making sure the heritage program gets to that, has the funding to get to that eventually. Um, Old growth forests are a key issue because they were almost decimated uh, around the turn of the last, or, or around the turn of the 1900s uh, by industrial logging before the Forest Service was founded. Um, and because we also, despite that, still have more old growth forests than the rest of the East. So that, it becomes a key issue. Ecological restoration is key, climate change is key. Uh, the wilderness inventory areas are important because they represent the wildest areas left in the Southern Blue Ridge and other special designations are also important. Uh, so I'll start with outdoor recreation. Um, again, uh, uh, hugely important, one, a big economic engine in our area. Uh, last report I uh, read, talked about North Carolina having over a $2 billion tourism industry, and a lot of that is due to our outdoor recreation. We also have a lot of uh, outdoor gear manufacturing companies locating in our area and uh, providing local manufacturing jobs um, due to the outdoor opportunities we have around here. Um, when it comes to the alternatives in the forest plan, unfortunately, uh, recreation is actually getting the short end of the stick compared to some of the other interest in the forest, which is kind of surprising. But I think it's, it's a symptom of the fact that we're getting so much recreational use here and the Forest Service is so underfunded and under-resourced in managing that use that we're getting and all those visitors. Um, Alternative B has, in my opinion, the best standards for trail sustainability because on the one hand it requires trail sustainability to be met before new trails are added, but it does not put a cap on new trails. And because we have such a demand for outdoor recreation around here, I think uh, continuing to force people onto a shrinking trail base will continue to create overuse, crowding, erosion issues, and other problems. Uh, so ideally we will be able to uh, maintain the trail system we have, grow it, especially in areas of the, of the national forest that are less used. Uh, some of those areas being like Graham County, uh, even Cherokee County to some extent, uh, having a lot less use than some of the other regions of, of the state. Um, 
one of the issues that we've heard about from some of our friends with horse and bicycle groups is the off-trail trail, uh, travel is uh, currently legal on the forest for horses and bikes. Um, I think from a, a sustainability standpoint, that needs to be corrected in some ways, but creating an all-out ban where a bicycle or a horse riding on an old uh, logging road that isn't an official trail uh, could get a ticket or, you know, uh, be uh, cited for an infraction, that seems like a little too much. There need to be some more direction without completely banning off-trail travel for horses and bikes. Um, and rock climbing components uh, need clarification to protect resources while allowing climbing. Basically, uh, there's some good uh, plan standards uh, uh, being proposed for protecting rare rock outcrops, but the way they're written is unclear and climbers are uh, concerned that it could lead to the closure, closure of, of a lot of climbing routes that are very sustainable and not causing uh, problems. When it comes to, to clean water, um, there, there are a lot of issues to deal with. Um, and obviously water is super important for recreation and ecology. Um, water quality largely depends on the maintenance of tr and management of tr roads and trails. Um, Nantahala Pisgah National Forest uh, owns and manages over 2,200 miles of roads. Uh, and as of 2013, there was a $37 million maintenance backlog for these forests. Um, now that's Congress's fault in some way, but it's also um, due to a lot of social pressures uh, that, that prevent roads from, um, in some cases, being gated. In other cases, some roads probably need to be closed. Um, just in general, roads and trails are not meeting maintenance standards, and that's leading to a lot of sediment getting into our streams. And so here's an example of a, of a road on Pisgah National Forest that was uh, recently uh, gated by the Forest Service, thank goodness. Uh, but it was, you know, literally dumping tons and tons of uh, sediment per mile into the stream downslope. Another big issue with the forest plan is riparian area management. Uh, these are sometimes known as streamside zones. Um, the draft forest plan has a 15 foot buffer on intermittent streams. Uh, these are streams that sometimes go underground um, and a 100 foot buffer on perennial streams, which are larger streams. Um, Unfortunately, there's no buffer on ephemeral streams, which are streams that flow for a portion of the year but dry up for another portion of the year. Um, the best available science indicates that there should be at least a 50-foot buffer on intermittent streams and a 25-foot buffer on ephemeral streams. And this is the norm for other Southern Appalachian forests, and we believe that the Nantahala and Pisgah should have uh, protections for water quality just as strong as the other Southern Appalachian forests do. So here's a diagram uh, of the proposed uh, streamside management zones. Uh, on the Nantahala Pisgah, and you'll notice that that uh, solid blue line is a perennial stream and it gets that full 100 foot buffer, that's good. But when you get into the dashed blue line of that intermittent stream, the buffer shrinks down to 15 feet. And those dashed gray lines, which uh, represent the ephemeral streams, do not have a buffer. Um, here is what the streamside management zone looks like on Cherokee National Forest with those uh, larger buffers that we're asking for. And you can see there's just uh, more protection especially for, for water quality. Another issue for, for water quality are plant standards on timber harvest, skid roads, and temporary roads. The current forest plan has a standard uh, that allows for logging on slopes over 40%, but requires a specific technology, skyline cable harvest. Uh, on slopes over 40%. So it prohibits uh, ground-based harvest on those steep slopes. It prohibits heavy equipment from driving up and down those slopes, and that helps to protect soil and water to a great extent. Um, unfortunately, the draft plan relaxes the standard, um, and we believe the draft plan needs stronger language on skid roads and temporary roads. And uh, in the link at the end of this presentation that Susan was talking about, you will find uh, the link to the Mountain Tree website that has that specific language we were asking the Forest Service for. So here is just a shot of what a temporary road looks like sometimes on timber harvest. So what you're looking at right in front of you is a temporary road. That uh, road higher up on the bank is actually a skid road. Um, and this is what this timber harvest site looks like from the air. Now, unfortunately, this area was just below that 40% threshold. I think there are areas of this, of this harvest unit that were around 38%. And because of the size and density of roads in this harvest unit and the high rainfall on types of soils here actually led to a pretty serious um, erosion event. So here's what it looked like. Um, on the top left-hand corner, you see the small stream coming out of the harvest unit under a small rain. Uh, just kind of a normal rain. And uh, on the top right, you see that stream going into 
to Courthouse Creek. And then uh, on the bottom, that's what it looked like after an inch of rain. You know, it turned the whole stream, you know, kind of chocolate milk covered, um, colored. You know, and the Forest Service, once they were alerted of this problem uh, by a local activist, they fixed it. But it still didn't prevent uh, many tons of, of sediment from going into this very high quality stream. And, you know, I don't want to exaggerate this too much. This is a one-time thing, and it's not necessarily the norm, but it's also not exactly unusual. And better plan standards could help to prevent uh, this sort of issue. I think I've been through most of this um, information already. But basically, the take home here is that the Forest Service really needs strong goals and objectives in the plan for uh, managing roads and trails. Uh, to make sure to protect our water quality. Uh, the good news is that there are two tiers of management under the forest uh, plan. Uh, there are two sets of objectives. One is a set of objectives that can meet, uh, well, basically that the Forest Service can do with current resources. Uh, the second set of objectives is what the Forest Service would like to do if they had more resources, either from the government or from help from partners, whether they be state, local, private uh, partners. And under those tier two objectives, there are, is some meaningful progress made. But uh, I believe the goals really need to be uh, more, more aggressive when it comes to maintaining and uh, roads and trails and to fixing water quality problems. So yeah, again, clean water, roads and trails is, is, a, is a big issue. And um, just some more inter images to drive that home. Um, you know, I guess another, another point I'd like to make is, is that um, the forest plan is prioritizing opening more roads to the public. This needs to be balanced with either more road maintenance resources or a prioritized reduction in the road system to balance the budget and protect water. So North Carolina Natural Heritage Program natural areas have been identified by Natural Heritage Program staff who are all trained scientists or biologists uh, since the 1970s. Um, the Mountain County inventories began in the 1990s, and sites are identified because they contain rare species and uh, natural communities. Um, identification does not create any sort of regulatory requirements or burdens on landowners. Um, so in this case, the Forest Service isn't required to do anything uh, just because the North Carolina Natural Heritage Program has documented something special on their land. Um, however, if a landowner chooses, they can enter into a registration or dedication agreement with the North Carolina Natural Heritage Program, and there are a few areas on the Nantahala Pisgah that have been dedicated. Um, it's no surprise that Nantahala and Pisgah National Forest have some of the nicest natural areas in all of Western North Carolina, and about 23% uh, about of the Nantahala Pisgah falls into uh, a natural area identified by the Heritage Program. Um, Amongst these natural areas, there's a large overlap with wilderness, wilderness inventory areas, and existing old growth forests. Um, a, a lot of these heritage areas fall into protective management areas, but a good amount of them don't. Um, fortunately, about 93,000 acres of the areas rated as exceptional uh, uh, have been proposed as special interest areas by the Forest Service. In all three of the action alternatives, alternatives B, C, and D, there are thousands of acres of natural heritage natural areas that are left in suitable management areas, meaning that they are likely to be prioritized for timber harvest. Um, there are about 34,000 acres in alternative C, about 68,000 acres in alternative B, and about 67,000 acres in alternative D that receive no formal protection. Um, the Forest Service has pledged to basically have a conversation with the Natural Heritage Program about these areas, which is what they currently do. And we've unfortunately seen in the past five years several areas where the uh, Forest Service went against the Natural Heritage Program recommendation for management and went ahead with the timber harvest, even when uh, adjusting boundaries was very uh, doable and on the order of five to 10 acres. So Mountain True has always recommended that all the Natural Heritage natural areas be placed in unsuitable management areas. And uh, if not, that standards and guides be developed that prevent uh, regeneration harvest. And regeneration harvest is basically the process of turning old forest into young forest. So basically cutting down most of the trees. This isn't to say that some of the natural areas couldn't benefit from some restoration, including some restoration timber harvest, but generally they don't need to be set back to zero. Ecological restoration, um, we believe, should be the management strategy for the National Forest. And this can include things like restoring brook trout to brook trout streams, uh, saving hemlocks and, emerald, uh, and ash trees from emerald ash borer beetle and hemlock woolly adelgid. Uh, it could be returning fire to fire adapted landscapes. Um, 
the definition of ecological restoration is basically returning the landscape to its pre-industrial condition or the natural range of variation for structure, composition, function, and connectivity. When the Forest Service evaluated the uh, current condition of the forest, they found a deficit of young forest, old growth forest, and open canopy forest compared to what are believed to be the natural range of variation conditions. Um, so, you know, a, a big, I think a big emphasis of this forest plan is likely to be creating more disturbance in the form of timber harvest and fire to increase the amount of young forest and open canopy forest. Uh, we believe that with more disturbance to create more young and open forest, we need more invasive plant management as another uh, leg of this restoration, restoration chair or table that the Forest Service is building. Yeah, unfortunately, timber harvest can really increase invasive species. This is an example of a timber harvest on Pisgah National Forest that occurred around 1997. Um, and unfortunately, it's dominated by only two species. One of them is native. Uh, it's uh, yellow poplar or tulip poplar uh, is the tree. And in the understory, you see stilt grass, which is an Asian grass species. And uh, yeah, so if this project had had more invasive species control, maybe this could have been prevented. Another element to restoration is restoring connectivity. This can be terrestrial or aquatic. You know, you see this culvert, you might not think perhaps that it is blocking connectivity, but uh, it actually does. There are a lot of organisms, organisms that can't make that jump into that culvert and up that culvert. So uh, the Forest Service will, under the plan, be uh, replacing a lot of these dysfunctional culverts, these perched culverts, with bottomless culverts that will allow fish and other aquatic organisms to move through. And that's just one example of restoring connectivity. Um, we do believe the Forest Service should set higher goals for restoring connectivity in streams. I think right now there's only uh, something like two projects per year being uh, proposed as the goal. Woodland restoration is basically this process of restoring open canopy forests. So here's an example on the Grandfather Ranger District that's had an active restoration program for about 10 years of an area uh, of Table Mountain Pine and Huckleberry that's starting to be restored into that open condition. It's great wildlife habitat and creates a much more resilient forest to wildfire. Uh, here's an example of another spot near Hot Springs that has seen some fire and is in that woodland condition. And these are generally in these drier forest types that see natural fire is where this work is going to happen. Old growth forests, um, make up less than 1% of the forest in the eastern US. Uh, some numbers place that as low as 6 tenths of 1%. In the southern Blue Ridge here, because we have steep mountains and inaccessible areas, about 3% of our landscape apparently escaped the ax uh, back in the early 1900s, late 1800s. Most of that acreage is in Smoky Mountains National Park and our national forest, Nantahala, Pisgah, Cherokee, Chattahoochee, et cetera. Um, and these are places that have great uh, value scientifically as wildlife habitat and also uh, aesthetically for people to enjoy. Um, the natural range of variation projection uh, states that there should be between around 470 and 540,000 acres of old growth forest to reach NRV. Uh, unfortunately, the old growth designations that the Forest Service is proposing don't add up to that. I think this could be pretty easily fixed just by uh, basically designated more of the unsuitable areas like wilderness areas. It's kind of interesting that not all of the wilderness areas are placed in old growth designation or backcountry areas, et cetera. Another thing we're asking for is that the uh, forest plan to create guidelines for the identification and protection of old growth forest during timber harvest projects. So when the for Forest Service goes out to design timber sales, uh, I oftentimes go along behind them and check out the forests that they are proposing for harvest. And occasionally I will find an area that I don't think has ever been logged. And uh, somehow the Forest Service misses that. I think it's because they don't have instructions in their forest plan to uh, require their employees to uh, collect data to evaluate the age of the forest and the, the history of the forest. So we think those uh, guidelines should be in the forest plan to prevent these uh, rare treasures from being cut in the uh, occasional timber sale. Wildlife is, is a huge issue on Nantahala Pisgah National Forest because of our great diversity and also because of the popularity of hunting and wildlife viewing as pastimes. Um, as I mentioned before, young forest habitat is at a, low, a level lower than the optimum on, on our forest. Um, and many species associated with uh, young forest are declining in our region. The draft forest plan sets up pretty robust goals for young forest habitat creation, uh, up to 3,700 acres annually in tier two management uh, with timber and fire. 
it being the primary methods for creating the young forest. Uh, many of our locally unique species are sensitive to these types of uh, disturbance, including plants, lichens, salamanders, snails, and others. Uh, but there are rare species, uh, especially some birds, that benefit from this type of management. So the key is to focus this work in ecozones where young forest is the most efficient and in places where it will not have unacceptable trade-offs with other rare species. Um, in the assessment period of the forest plan, I actually helped the Forest Service with an initial uh, departure analysis uh, uh, looking at the natural range of variation for the Nantahala Pisgah. And one of the biggest findings when I looked across the ecosystems of the national forests um, and across the landscape as a whole is that there was an inversion in the amount of disturbance that was occurring on our landscape, where the forest types that naturally would have the greatest amount of disturbance, like pine oak heath forest, this is table mountain pine, pitch pine forest with mountain laurel and huckleberry and uh, blueberry and grasses and whatnot. Um, under historical conditions with a natural fire regime, we believe that only 8% of that forest would have been a closed canopy. Currently, 92% of that ecosystem is closed canopy on Forest Service lands and 87% on all lands. There's a simple reason for that, uh, a couple simple reasons. One is that uh, we are not allowing fires to burn like they did historically. That's one major reason. The other major reason is Pine Oak Heath Forest does not grow commercially viable timber. It has species of a type and of a size that just are, are not commercially attractive, so timber harvest does not occur there. In contrast, rich cove forest does grow very commercially valuable timber and it occurs in these protected uh, concave slopes that focus moisture um, and produce a lot of diversity, a lot of herbaceous cover and grows very big trees. You know, under historical conditions, we believe that about 96% of the rich cove forest would have been closed canopy, but under today's conditions, we find that about 84% of rich cove forest is closed canopy. And on, uh, on private land, a much lower percentage, 68% is closed canopy. So this is an ecosystem that's being more heavily used for timber harvest. And that's creating this imbalance between these two. It's this economic incentive. So a lot of the ecosystem restoration that needs to be done um, is in these ecosystems that, that don't necessarily have an economic incentive. Um, timber and forest products are a big issue in the forest plan and a key part of our local culture. Um, and this is, you know, we're talking about morels, galax, ramps, saw logs, pulp, uh, talking about uh, white oak baskets, all different sorts of products. Um, if you look at timber harvest by alternative, uh, if you just look at the raw acres and suitable management, there's a pretty big spread between alternative C and alternative B. It's about 125,000 acres. Um, if you look down in that lower table, this is from the, the draft environmental impact statement um, of the forest plan. You will see that uh, as a total, alternative C has uh, only about um, 30,000 acres less of commercially viable timber compared to alternative B. So that 125,000 acres extra of suitable land in alternative B only nets the Forest Service and the local timber industry about 30,000 extra acres. Um, and unfortunately, pr probably a lot of that is coming out of, potentially coming out of places like North Carolina and natural heritage areas. In the draft plan, um, the Forest Service proposes about 1,200 acres a year of regeneration harvest under tier one and up to 3,250 acres a year in tier two. Um, when I analyzed the alternatives, it looks like every alternative has a minimum from that last slide of 235,000 acres of potentially accessible commercially viable timber. In addition to that currently commercially viable timber, there's a lot of timber out there that has been cut previously that's under 60 years of age that eventually in the next several decades will age in to uh, production. So if you're looking at timber harvest over the long term and thinking about uh, the compatibility of timber harvest with, um, with other uses, it's my view that there's uh, probably enough out there to meet the needs of the local economy and the timber industry and young forest habitat and protect the special places that we believe probably ought not to be harvested. So here, here's basically just a map of that younger uh, saw timber that's on the forest, uh, that potentially operable saw timber um, that is in places that would be consensus areas for timber harvest. So it, this is also the inverse way to look at this map is these are areas that have been harvested in the past several decades already. 
Um, this is where the Forest Service has been. This is the footprint of timber harvest on the forest uh, over the last several decades. You, you notice that there's actually quite a large footprint in the Hiawassee Reservoir area out in the western part of the state. Um, so if you include that younger uh, forest that will become mature at some point with the, the acres that are currently mature, there's about 322,000 acres at a minimum of commercially viable timber uh, available. Um, and that is enough to max out the goals for timber harvest under this current plan. This, uh, under that level of timber harvest, it looks like we could also place all the existing old growth forest, natural heritage, natural areas, and those wilderness inventory areas in unsuitable management areas. So most of the highest priority uh, uh, ecological forestry is non-commercial. And in addition, there is plenty of room for the commercial forestry to proceed while also protecting special resources. And that's basically the point I want to make. It really is, you know, collaboration is about trying to meet other folks' needs while also meeting your needs. And so that's basically what I'm trying to demonstrate here with this timber harvest analysis and example. Um, and just to back this up even a little bit more, if you look at the protection priorities on the forest that Mountain True has set out, it's about 483,000 acres. Um, within that 483,000 acres, there are 1,751 rare species occurrences. The rest of the forest has 496,000 acres and just 294 rare species occurrences and the vast majority of the road system. So again, these are potentially compatible management strategies if the Forest Service chooses to make it so. Now, if uh, you are a person that does not want to see timber harvest in the National Forest, I uh, have some bad news for you. That's not, not likely to happen without an act of Congress, and this forest plan is seeking to increase the amount of timber management. The good news I have for you is that timber management can occur in a way that's sensitive to the environment, and it doesn't have to look bad. Here's a great example of a timber harvest that looked really good when it was over. Um, Wilderness inventories are another big issue with the plan. I'm running a little short on time. So I think uh, basically I'll, I'm gonna skim through this portion, but basically we have one of the wildest areas in the Eastern US. There are about 350,000 acres of potential wilderness areas identified in 53 areas. These are the best candidates for, for backcountry management or wilderness designation. And includes about, these include about two thirds of the acreage identified as uh, natural heritage, natural areas. Um, and there's just a difference in protection across the alternatives, um, where um, alternative uh, um, B actually, rep re again, recommends the most wilderness. Alternative C recommends the least wilderness. Uh, so here's an example. Well, alternative C is in some ways the most protective of the natural resources, but also recommends the least wilderness, whereas alternative B might be the least protective, but recommend the most wilderness. Um, we believe that basically these areas should be included in unsuitable management areas wherever possible. There are some exceptions where it might, may make sense to put these in to suitable management. Um, and if I had more time, I would explain this map to you. But basically, this is showing those wilderness inventory areas in blue. And then um, the areas in yellow are the proportions that are suitable um, in the draft forest plan under various alternatives in this case, alternative D. Um, so this is our basic recommendation is that um, wilderness inventory areas, if they were identified as being potentially suitable for wilderness, they should be placed in unsuitable management areas. There are a lot of other special designations, including uh, wild and scenic rivers, national recreation areas, and national scenic areas. Um, there are a, a lot of wilderness designations out there in this plan. Uh, ranging, like I said, from 126,000 acres to 11,000 acres between the alternatives. Um, Unicoi Mountain, Snowbird Creek, Tusquiddy Bald, Lesser Bald, Craggy Mountain, Black Mountain, Bald Mountain, Mackey Mountain, Harper Creek, and Lost Cove are all recommended as standalone new areas under alternative B. And additions to Joyce Kilmer Slick Rock, Southern Nantahala Wilderness, Ellicott Rock, Middle Prong, Shining Rock, and Linville Gorge are also possible under alternative B. Um, one of the areas that is broadly supported for designation as both wilderness and a national scenic area are the Craggy Mountains. Um, and uh, last, just I believe it was last week or the week before, Buncombe County unanimously passed a resolution supporting designation of a national scenic area in the Craggy Mountains. So we're hoping the Forest Service will listen to that recommendation. 
getting close to the end here. Um, and one of the last uh, forms of designation are wild and scenic rivers. Um, the Wild and Scenic River Act uh, was created basically to prevent some of our rivers from being dammed. And if you all live in Western North Carolina, you know that a lot of our major rivers are dammed, especially on the Hiawassee system, the Little Tennessee system. Um, so there are many streams on the Nantahala Pisgah that qualify for wild and scenic due to their outstanding and remarkable values, um, including outstanding fisheries, uh, biological values, scenery, uh, and wild character. Um, there's a long list of those. I don't have time to go through those all right now, but uh, Callie has a really great presentation on water quality up on the Mountain True website, and I recommend if you're interested in water seek rivers or water quality issues, checking out that uh, presentation. These are just some of the examples of streams that are potentially eligible for wild and scenic designation. They can be big, they can be small. Another key issue in the draft forest plan and in our lives in general is climate change. Um, so the draft environmental impact statement has content on climate change, including uh, content on connectivity to make sure species can migrate to adapt to climate, uh, content on resilience to disturbance, including fire and floods, some content on carbon sequestration, et cetera. Um, unfortunately, I would say the, the main criticism with the, the the forest plan is that a lot of the information in the environmental impact statement on climate change doesn't get translated into management strategies like guidelines or standards in the plan. So that's an area we are asking the Forest Service to improve. So congratulations, you've made it almost to the end of this presentation. Um, I'm hoping that you are inspired to make a difference when it comes to management of your national forest. Uh, they are your public lands and uh, you deserve a say in how they're managed, as do all of your friends and neighbors and all the people of this nation. So uh, urging you to stay engaged and to talk to your friends and neighbors, definitely comment on the draft environmental impact statement. Again, there will be a link at the end of this presentation for you to go to the Mountain True website and make a comment. Uh, if you have the energy uh, today, do that today. If not, come back to it later and make a comment and, and spread the word. Um, if there ever are public meetings, which is looking doubtful due to COVID-19, go to the public meetings. You can also write letters to your elected officials supporting consensus win-win management for the forests. Write letters to the editor of your local papers uh, and support local conservation groups that work to uh, improve public land management. So there is the, uh, the URL there for the comment. You will, that will pop up at the end of this. Um, some some tips on commenting, you can, you can submit a letter directly to the Forest Service, mailing it to them. You can go through their comment portal if you want. I would suggest going through ours because we have uh, some tips there for commenting right alongside the, the comment box. Um, in general, again, place-based comments if you know a place well. Talk about the, the qualities of that place and how you think it should be managed. I think that's very strong. Uh, you do not have to choose one alternative. You can tell the Forest Service what you think is the right course of action. Um, if you do, you know, kind of go out on your own, I would also put in a good word for other interests in the forest uh, and make sure that you, you know, tell the Forest Service to balance these interests in a way that works for everyone as much as possible. Um, you can comment more than once, as many times as you like. This is not voting. This is about getting the best information to the Forest Service. And we don't know when the end date is. Uh, be sure to get your comment in. My guess is it's going to be June uh, sometime, June 14th to June 30th, I would say. Well, we will actually know this week when the, when the, adjusted comment deadline is. And that is all I have for you. And um, if you all have more questions or any discussion items, we can we can continue on with some question and answer. We do have some more questions. Good. Um, the first one is, uh, is the $37 million backlog of road work because um, they haven't been funded in the budget to do the maintenance or they haven't had the personnel resources and time to be able to do the maintenance or both. Yeah, those two are connected. The, the personnel and the funding are directly connected. But I would say there's a, a number of, of reasons for this. I would say that there was an overbuilding of the road system in the 1980s when the timber harvest was unsustainable. Uh, in order to meet those unsustainable timber targets they were receiving from Congress and that bad forest plan in 87, they had to build more roads than they could actually maintain. That's one, one problem. Second problem is the, the problem with, um, with funding. Um, and, uh, you know, 
I'd, I guess those are probably the main two that I can think of. Probably just a little bit of an overbuilt system and then uh, problems with funding. I guess the third one would be just a general reluctance to ever uh, let go of any roads, to, to decommission roads. Uh, yeah. Okay, the next question is, um, how is the Forest Service going to accomplish the needed disturbance in the areas that aren't considered economically viable? Yeah, um, I think that will happen in a couple of different ways. Most likely it will happen either through controlled burns or through um, subsidized management. And so that we're talking about, you know, paying people to go in and cut trees that are just going to lay on the ground and turn into soil uh, in order to create habitat. Um, and, you know, those, those goals can work kind of in concert a little bit. Some of the most effective ways to protect uh, communities that border the forest from wildfire is actually uh, the combination of thinning and controlled burning. Uh, but that needs to be done near the communities. That's not something you do way back in the middle of nowhere. It's something you do adorning the communities. Um, you know, I think one thing is when it comes to economics that we need to be prepared for right now is that um, the timber industry is having a historically bad time and we're having a historically bad time prior to COVID-19 even. Um, I was talking with a forester on Nantahala National Forest and they had four timber sales last year that did not receive a bid. And these were, these were timber sales with nice big hardwood trees. Um, and it's because the, the, the mills here couldn't sell the timber. Part of that was because there was a trade war with China. Part of it's because of just economic, global economics in general aren't always friendly to local economics. Uh, and now with COVID-19, we have a lot of mills actually just shutting down and they may never come back. So we actually probably need to think about subsidizing the needed management on national forests. Uh, you know, five years ago, we were probably thinking that some of, the, some of our timber would help pay for the restoration we needed. Right now, it looks like we need to probably come up with some sort of a, a public works program if we really want our, our forest managed well, at least in the next uh, two to five years. Mm -hmm. Okay, your discussion about fire is kind of a lead into to the next question, the answer to the next question, I think. Um, the question is whether any of the forest management alternatives will protect Western North Carolina's forests from wildfires. And in parenthesis, it says, recalling how the president criticized the state of California for failing to properly manage the forest, thereby placing vulnerable areas at high risk for wildfires. So, um, mm -hmm just a little discussion about how the management is going to protect us from wildfires. Well, you know, uh, um, I think if the management is um, directed into the right eco zones, it can help protect from wildfire. So on the screen right now, I have a rich cove eco zone. This, this is not the kind of forest that burns. That gr all that green material there doesn't generally burn. Um, you know, maybe under some exceptions, but even when those places do burn, it's just a very light surface fire and not all that dangerous. Um, on the other hand, some of those ridgetop forests and forests on steep slopes burn very severely, and you can still see the scars of those 2016 fires we have around here. And um, not all those scars are a bad thing. Some of those scars are creating good wildlife habitat. Some of them are helping to renew the ecosystems that hadn't seen a fire in a long time. Um, but, you know, if you've got a, a house next to the forest, those, that's not what you want right next door. So it, it really does depend on the Forest Service directing their management into the right places. They can't manage everywhere. Uh, we've seen that in the past 20 years and we're going to continue to see that, that there's probably more management that needs to be done than we can do. So it's about doing the highest priority management. And in the case of fire protection, we do really need to subsidize that. That's generally not commercial management. That is re you know, repeated thinnings and controlled burns to reduce fuel loads and uh, reduce fire danger near communities. Okay, is there a map that shows natural heritage areas with an overlay of suitable management areas? Uh, I could make a map of that. I actually had a, let me go back. I'll, I'll go back, I had a slide on that. Uh, so since we have that come up as a question, here we go. So this is a complicated map. It shows uh, wilderness inventory areas in blue that are, uh, this is alternative D. The Forest Service is marketing alternative D as the middle alternative sort of. Uh, uh, and um, so the blue ones are in backcountry or recommended wilderness, so that's compatible. Then you have in red, you've got the natural areas. So all those red natural areas are the natural areas that are in the suitable management area under alternative D, that's 68,000 acres of suitable natural areas. 
and alternative D. Now when you add up the number of suitable wilderness inventory areas and suitable natural areas in alternative D, it actually is probably the worst alternative for my interest, uh, for Mountain True's interests. And so a little uh, disappointed that the Forest Service is marketing that one as some sort of a intermediate uh, alternative. But uh, so here, yeah, all, all these, this is kind of the worst case scenario for natural areas. All those red areas on this map are natural areas that are in um, suitable management in alternative D. Okay. Um, that's all the questions for the moment, um, but I wanted to, um, you to touch on a couple of um, more region specific things and I can help out with this too, but I've reviewed the participant list and almost everybody, if not everybody, is from um, the Hiawassee River watershed area, Clay and Cherokee County, um, and, you know, potentially on the Macon side um, in the Nantahala Mountains GA. And so I was just wondering if you could talk a little bit about the um, wilderness recommendations um, that did not get picked up by the plan and then any anything else that's just kind of, um, you know, more specific to this area down in the far west. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, so um, I, I did go past the wilderness recommendations very rapidly. Um, and, uh, so, and again, there's a, a huge range in wilderness recommendations between alternative C that only has 11,000 acres. I believe the ones in alternative C that, that made it are um, Craggy Mountain. Mm -hmm. uh, was it Snowbird in alternative uh, C? Snowbird's in there, yeah. And then I think- um, There's may, one more, but it's way up. Maybe Harper Creek or one of those up there. Yeah. Um, under um, alternative B, there's a lot more. So it's just starting on the west hand, uh, the west part of uh, western part of the area. This area here, I'm circling Unicoi Mountain. That area in blue and a little bit more. I guess actually including all the area in blue and yellow here is uh, recommended for wilderness in the Unicoi Mountain area, and that that backs up to the Upper Bald River uh, wilderness that was just designated last year in Tennessee. And of course, here is uh, Snowbird here. Um, and then we have the Joyce Kilmer additions here that were recommended in alternative B. Um, the bit largest standalone uh, wilderness, um, potential wilderness area is Tusquity Bald. Mm -hmm. I think there was a 19,000 acre area recommended in alternative B. Uh, I think in alternative D, there's still a 16,000 acre area uh, recommended for Tusquity Bald. Um, Southern Nantahala Wilderness has a number of additions. Um, under alternative B, those total uh, a pretty large acreage. I'm, I'm not exactly sure, but I do know that the Chunky Gal addition is 7,000 acres alone, and then there's a couple thousand acres uh, on the southern, uh, southeastern end, and then in Clay County, uh, a couple areas that are just a, under 1,000 acres each along the Georgia line uh, below Hightower Bald. Um, I guess this is getting a little bit out of that Cherokee and Clay County area, but uh, Westerbald is also, that's in Swain and Macon, recommended in Alternative B. Uh, Overflow Wilderness Study Area is recommended in Alternative B. Um, and that pretty much covers areas on Nantahala National Forest. Yeah, that's excellent. Um, the other thing that I would mention is that uh, we had recommended, and we being Mountain True, as well as the Hiawassee River Watershed Coalition and other members of the Nantala Pisgah Forest Partnership had recommended a long length of Fires Creek um, to be uh, written into the plan as eligible wild and scenic, uh, eligible for wild and scenic designation. And the draft plan does put in um, Fires Creek, but it's only 2.6 miles at the very lower end. And so that's something um, that you'll also see in my water webinar if you go and watch that. Um, but we want that mileage to be significantly extended. Um, and, and wild and scenic designation, basically it does two major things. I mean, there's more to it than this, but one, it prevents dams from ever being built. Um, and then the second thing is, is that requires a management plan for the corridor, which is just really helpful um, way to protect water quality in a watershed is to have a management plan for it. So um, that's the main reason why we're recommending it is just to get that specific area management plan. So. All righty, any more questions? This is the last call for questions in the Q&A box. 
And again, um, the water webinar, we're having this series of topic specific webinars and um, that website that Josh mentioned, you might be able to make your way back to that slide, Josh, that has the website. Um, in addition to having the tips for commenting and the, um, and the comment box itself with our um, standard comment that you can modify, um, there is also an analysis that Josh wrote that summarizes basically Josh's presentation in very um, succinct snippets for you um, that tell you kind of what our comments, uh, are, where our comments are headed for each particular um, section of the plan or topic in the plan, I guess. But then um, we also have uh, some more um, specific uh, topic area presentations coming up. I don't know, Susan, did you want to talk about that or? Um, let's see if I can remember this off the top of my head. We have uh, invasive species is maybe going to be the next one. No, it's management areas. I've got it. I just okay. Didn't sorry, Kelly. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so the next topic specific webinar is going to be on May 19th at 5.30 p.m. And this is Josh again talking about the different management areas in the plan. So it'll be more information about the different management areas. And then in June, we're going to have one on invasive species. And then there's going to be a panel on recreation. And you can find the signups and the information for those on the Mountain Tree website. Um, and uh, those will both be at 530 on their respective dates in June. Um, we actually have one more question that came in through the chat and that is, um, it's from Mary Leitner actually, and it says, what is the most effective way to advocate for funding for the Forest Service? That's a great question. Yeah, I think the most effective way is through your federal representatives, either senators or congresspeople. Mm -hmm. That's what I would say, uh, and I, I, also through the media. I would get, I think, because the media could put some pressure on this elected. And so, in our area, it's going to be very important that we um, elect someone that for um, District 11 U.S. House that we feel will actually listen and take our um, comments to Washington with him about funding for the. Or yeah, it will be a well, no, it could be a her, him or her, <laughs> to Washington, um, and and actually. Um, lobby is not the right word, advocate for more funding for the Forest Service for our region. And um, so the election in November is a big one because we don't currently have a representative um, at the federal level. And yeah, what, one of the tragedies of COVID-19 was um, there was building momentum to uh, permanently fund the Land and Water uh, Conservation Fund, which is uh, a fund that is funded by uh, oil and gas leases on federal land. So it's sort of uh, there to acknowledging that, that oil and gas uh, development on, on public land causes damage. And it's a way to sort of offset that damage with additional purchases with, and in the new authorization, it would have included maintenance money for public mm -hmm. land as well. Uh, uh, so I, I think that's kind of on hold for now, but it was just about to pass right before COVID-19 hit. So that's, that's bad news. I will also mention that Senator Burr has generally been fairly strong on public land issues and is a good person to talk to, as well as Senator Burr's staff. Uh, Senator Tillis could, could use more encouragement, I would say, on public land. Um, or a different representative. Or, well, or Senator Burr or uh, Tillis, and if someone replaces Senator Tillis, we need to work on that person too to make sure that they, they yes. do better. Um, <laughs> yeah, uh, so, um, I, I did, did pull up this link that Callie asked for. I will also just remind folks that you will get that link in a follow-up message from, from this presentation if you signed up for it. And I assume you did if you're on this, on this call. Mary, would you like to turn your microphone on and tell these people what you just put in the chat box or would you like me to read it? You're muted still, Mary. <laughs> There we go. <laughs> okay. Um, PPN is working on candidate profiles um, that include um, positions that we can find on um, their positions on health, the environment, and financial security. And we have a PPN um, election 2020 page on Facebook. Uh, where we're putting those. 
So that may help people to, um, you know, more quickly find out how a, a given candidate feels about um, um, environmental issues. Great. All righty. Well, Susan, you want to wrap us up? <laughs> I don't actually have anything in conclusion, um, but you know, you guys will see that that comment page pop up on your screen and we encourage you to comment. Okay. Thanks everyone. Thanks, Thanks so much, Josh and Callie. You guys are great. Yep. Okay. Thanks so much. Bye-bye.